Monsters is a podcast about the worst human beings on the planet. The episodes of this podcast deal with murder, dismemberment, torture, rape, child abuse, and mental illness. Please turn back while you still can. Listener discretion advised. 14 Days That's how long Kalia McNabb lived her life with her parents, Christopher McNabb and Courtney Bell. After spending most of that time strung out on meth, on October 6, 2017, McNabb would beat Kalia so severely that her skull was damaged beyond repair. Then, the baby was put into a bag and hid in the woods by their home. This is Monsters. Come back and find out that he's deceased. Tap me on the head, telling me I'm cheating, telling me I'm, you know, let me see your phone. Just kill her, and she dies. I think Diego Campione is totally in the wrong, and I hope he burns in hell for all his sins. Hell's not a very fun place. I only have two hands. I'm that four hands girl. I'm two hands. And I don't know, it's just get escalated and escalated. <laughs> The killing of a child by their parents is called filicide, but the killing of a baby, a child who is less than one year old, is called infanticide. Infanticide was actually a fairly common practice in past societies. In the Stone Age, it's estimated that between 15 and 50 percent of infants were killed. As a method of saving resources, babies who were sick or disabled were usually abandoned and left to die, though some did kill them manually. In places like the Inca Empire and Carthage, archaeologists uncovered evidence of child sacrifice. The practice was still used in more recent eras in places like Greece, China, Japan, and with Native Americans. In ancient Greece, Aristotle advocated for the death of children with congenital defects, saying, As to the exposure of children, let there be a law that no deformed child shall live. Infanticide finally waned in the first millennium due to Christianity, paganism, and Islam all forbidding the act. It is now generally illegal to kill an infant in all developed countries worldwide. Studies show that though fathers commit filicide at a slightly higher rate, mothers specifically commit infanticide more often than fathers. Mothers are far more likely to commit neonaticide, which is the act of killing a child within the first 24 hours of their life. Christopher McNabb is no stranger to the law. He started a lengthy career fighting, stealing, and running away from home when he was only 14 years old. His father called the police on him multiple times for assault, theft, and to report him as a runaway. In 2007, at the age of 17, McNabb was arrested for theft, criminal trespass, larceny theft, criminal damage to property, criminal trespass, and auto theft. He had stolen a 2006 Ford F-350 and smashed it through a locked gate in order to take it. Nearly two weeks later, he was arrested again after police were called by a security guard who claimed that McNabb tried to run him over while he was in the process of stealing a 1989 Ford truck. He used the truck to break through a fence. Now, if you're thinking that Christopher McNabb probably learned his lesson and stopped stealing cars, think again. Chris McNabb is clearly no quitter, because just nine days later, police were called to a fabrication shop in Taylorsville, Georgia, where the owner reported a break-in. McNabb had stolen a 1964 Buick Skylark, and do you want to know how he got it off the property? You guessed it, he crashed it through the gate to the facility. You gotta give him points for consistency. After being caught for two more thefts, he finally spent a few years in prison. He was released in the summer of 2011, but it didn't take him long to violate his probation. Christopher McNabb met Courtney Bell in 2013, and they dated for a few years before having a child together around 2015. Their first child was Clarissa, and there's no record of any abuse with her. The couple had a history of drug use, and McNabb admitted that he used meth every day. But Bell had claimed to have not smoked meth for three years during one of her police interviews in 2017. Bell would also admit in a police interview that she was regularly physically abused by McNabb. She said that she had bruises all over her body. On September 23, 2017, 
Kalia was born about a month premature. She stayed in the hospital for a few days before being able to go home with her parents. In the few days that Kalia was alive, it's said that she spent quite a few of them in the care of others. Bell's own father, Tim Bell, called police just a few days before the baby's murder to report that the children should be removed from the home. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. At this time, McNabb had an active warrant out for his arrest for a probation violation. This would come into play later when he used that as a reason for running from the police. On October 7, 2017, sometime in the morning, authorities believe that Christopher McNabb was awoken by Kalia crying, and in a drug-induced rage, he beat the baby to death. He then wrapped her in her blanket and one of his shirts before placing her in a drawstring bag and hiding her under a log in the woods near their trailer park. According to McNabb, he fed and changed Kalia at about 5 o'clock in the morning before putting her to bed and going to sleep himself. He was awoken by a text message from his father at 9.30 a.m. He went and checked on both of his daughters and found them both asleep, so he grabbed a blanket from the bedroom and went back to sleep with Belle, who had fallen asleep on the couch in the living room. At about 10 a.m., Clarissa came into the living room and was in some sort of distress. She was whining and didn't really say anything besides, Mama, Mama. McNabb claims to have gone into the bedroom and found Kalia's empty bed. That's when the couple began tearing the house apart, looking for the baby. McNabb got some clothes on and started walking around outside, searching for Kalia, while Bell called 911. Newton County 911, the emergency. I just woke up. My dog woke me up on the couch. Um, I have a two-year-old and I have a two-week-old. And my, my two-week-old is not in her sleeper. Her pack is on the floor. She's not in her sleeper? I, she's not in her sleeper. She, she, she's not here. I've looked everywhere. I've looked under clothes and everything. What's your address, ma'am? Yes, lot 31. Do you think somebody took her, ma'am? My child said, my, my, my two-year-old says she's gone. And, and I've looked everywhere in the house, so I don't, I don't know another possibility. Okay. And you said you were sleeping, woke up, and she was gone? Yes. My, my, my two-year-old came and woke me up. Okay. So I thought she was on the couch. Kalea! How old is she, ma'am? Two weeks old. Okay. And you, who else would have come in your house? I, I mean, as far as I know, nobody would have came in my house. My two-year-old says, Papa, but I called my dad and I called my grandparents, and they don't have her. Okay. My dad's on the way here now. All right. How long have you been asleep? Um, the last time I woke up with her was around, I guess, five, maybe. A number of things strike me as odd in this call. First, it takes her a long time to even notify the operator that her child is not where she's supposed to be. Her first priority seems to be in making sure the operator knows that she was sleeping. She tells the operator that she woke up, and then reiterated that her two-year-old just woke her up. This is to reinforce the idea that she's not involved, because how could she be? She was asleep. Second, she never says the baby is missing. She says that she's not in her sleeper, and that her pacifier is on the floor. If she already knows that Kalia is dead, Saying that she's missing would be a lie. When she says the baby is not in her sleeper, that's true. She isn't in her sleeper. She goes on to say, I've looked everywhere. She's not here. Another true statement. Next, she never calls either girl by their name. She continually refers to them as my two-year-old and my two-week-old. A very impersonal way to refer to your children. This is until she yells out for Kalia as if a two-week-old baby has any ability to understand what that means, or could respond in any way. It may seem trivial, but when the operator asks her, who else would have come into your house? Instead of simply saying, nobody, she repeats, nobody would have came into my house. Repeating a question within an answer can be a sign that someone is looking elsewhere for a scripted answer instead of just answering off the top of their head. Okay, so the only thing is miss that's missing is her and her blanket. Yeah. And he didn't talk to the dad or grandma or anybody else? Uh, dad was here with me. Dad just left and, and he's walking around the park looking for her. 
because my two-year-old says, I asked her, did somebody come in and take her? And she said, yeah, but I don't, I, you know, she's two, so I don't know if right. I can believe right. that or, or not. Did you look through everything, like under the bed? Yes, the ma'am. Bathrooms? Yes, ma'am. I find it strange that she's so sure that nothing else is missing from the house. If I were frantically searching my house for a missing baby, I don't feel like I would have any idea what may be missing. She's very clear that only the baby and the blanket are missing. The last part of this clip is what I find most strange. She claims that she asked her two-year-old, again, never using her name, if someone came in and took Kalia, and she says yeah. Then she says, quote, She's two. I don't know if I believe her, end quote. There's a lot of red flags in this 911 call. The police arrive on scene and begin searching for the infant. They search the inside of the home and the area around the property, but they understandably focus on who could have taken the baby. A 14-day-old baby couldn't even crawl away, let alone get out of the sleeper, get down the hall, and open a door. I told you to come. Give me a general idea, though. I went straight through. There's a cut that goes straight through. Give me a favor and walk over there. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You said you walked through the cut because it cuts to Henderson Mill. Right now we're just trying to figure out where this two-year-old is, and we need your help. Two weeks. I'm sorry. I mean, I don't have no idea. I don't want you to go into the woods, but just give me a general idea that you went through right here. I went through, and we straight. Like pretty much clear all the way through. Okay. Straight out of here to the middle. Okay. And then you went all the way. Like, see, if you step back right here. Uh huh. Look through that cut. It goes straight through, and you can see hands in the road once you get halfway down. Okay. 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 I mean, that's the flashlight and everything. Okay. Yeah. Do me a favor, stand here and just kind of communicate with the deputy right here. McNabb had been searching the area himself and pointed officers to the area he had looked. It's possibly an effort to say, hey, I already looked there, so you don't have to, but that's only speculation. Volunteers and police begin searching the area around the trailer park where McNabb and Bell lived in an effort to find the missing infant. The parents went down to the police station voluntarily to be questioned. McNabb describes the event of October 7, 2017. This audio is a recording from the court where the interview is being played, so the audio quality is terrible. I apologize. We woke up at 9.30. We texted my dad. Girl, what do you do? I got to check on the baby. They were both in there. I grabbed the blanket off the bed, went and covered me and pulled him back to sleep. Okay. Then I went back to the bed and covered him back to sleep. Okay. Then I went back to the bed and covered him back he went out freaking out, crying over he did, acting a little strange, making up to his door, like I said. Mm -hmm. What'd you say? She was just, she didn't say nothing really, she was just moaning, moaning, as pretty much I was saying. Mm -hmm. And then, we're gonna take it up and check on the I went in there and she was gone. He says that he woke up at 9.30 with a text from his dad. He went and checked on the babies. They were both there. He grabbed a blanket off the bed, went and covered himself and Courtney up, and went back to sleep. Then that's when his daughter woke them up, freaking out or, you know, she wouldn't talk, freaking out, crying a little bit, acting a little strange, backing up into the corner, like I said. The detective asks him what she said. McNabb explains that she didn't say nothing, really. She was just, mama, mama, that's pretty much all she would say. Then Courtney said to get up and go check on Kalia. Then he went in there, and she was gone. The next strange thing to get said in this case is when McNabb describes blaming Clarissa for the disappearance of Kalia. In all that, um, the girl asked, what'd you do with that kid? What'd you do with it? Where's she at? I don't know. Where'd you put her? What'd you do with it? He says that between everything else, Clarissa was asked, what did you do with baby sissy? 
what did you do with her, where is she at? Then he says, gone, meaning that that was what the two-year-old had answered. When the detective inquires about who asked her that, McNabb responds, Courtney. She was like, where'd you put her? What did you do with her? And Clarissa said, gone. Then he put his clothes on and went looking for any clues. So they blamed their two-year-old daughter for the disappearance of their newborn baby. Belle is questioned separately where she gives an account that aligns with what McNabb said. The couple were released that night without charges. At some point on October 8th, Belle and McNabb both were traveling in a car being driven by friend Lauren McKee, and Belle's mother, Pamela Hamby, was also in the car. They had left a news station where Belle had made a plea for the return of her daughter. At about 4 p.m. on the 8th, search teams found a blue drawstring bag hidden under a log in the woods around the trailer park. Inside the bag was the tiny body of Kalia McNabb. Okay, and did you see anything that was out of the ordinary for being in the woods? Um, yes, eventually I did come to a clearing. Um, it looked like a, a log that was sitting there. It just looked at a place. It was sitting over a big open hole. Did you see anything in, in that area? Um, I, I started looking. The tree log was unusual to me, the way it was sitting. And under the log was a pile of sticks and twigs up underneath it. Um, I had picked up one of the sticks and began to move away some of the leaves, and that's when I saw the black string. Okay. Um, and did you do anything about that black string? Um, I took the stick and I pulled it up to see what it was, and it was a bag, and that's when I told one of the children to go get the officer. Okay, and did law enforcement come over to where you were? Yes, ma'am. Okay, do you remember what that bag looked like? Yes, ma'am. Okay, can you explain it? Um, it was like a royal blue, like a medium shade blue, with a red small Michael Jordan symbol on it with black drawstrings. It was a drawstring boot bag. While Lauren was driving McNabb, Belle, and her mother through town, Belle's aunt, Kim, called to let them know that the baby had been located. According to the driver, as soon as McNabb got the news, he began freaking out, saying that they were going to say that he did it and he wanted to get out of the car. Um, I do remember um, Chris saying that they're going to take him to jail. Um, I do remember say him saying that. Um, I do remember... Um, everybody freaking out because Chris was scared about going to jail. And what did you uh, say about him getting out of the car or stopping at the marathon? I was screaming no at everybody that God's got us. We got to get to the baby. I, you know, I was screaming no. At that time, did you know whether the baby had been found alive or dead? No, I had no idea. I thought the baby was alive. Did it strike you as odd that Chris McNabb wanted to jump out of the car when he found his baby had been found? <laughs> Very much so. When Belle got the news that Kalia had been found, nobody else in the car knew if that meant she was found alive or dead. Lauren says that the father never asked about that. He was sure that they were going to blame him and wanted to be dropped off at a marathon gas station. And, and the part that I just showed you to refresh your memory, did Mr. McNabb say they're going to put it on me? Um, I believe that that was the general gist of what he was saying, yes ma'am. And that's specifically what you told Investigator Alexander? Yes. And you indicated that he didn't ask if the baby was alive? Nothing <laughs> like that? You have no hope or nothing? Is that what you said? Yes, ma'am. Now, after he jumped out of the car, and I believe you said he, how was he acting at that time? Like they were, they were all acting like they were on meth. Um, they were acting really sketchy. I don't know what I said exactly in the statement, but they were all acting crazy. Did you say he started freaking out, acting crazy, wanted me to drop him off at the marathon and jumped out of the car? Yeah. Once McNabb had jumped out of the car, Lauren thought they should get back to the trailer park so they could check on the status of the baby. That's not the first place that Belle wanted to go, though. What did you continue to do? Where'd you go? I was screaming at everybody to shut the F up, sit down, we're going to the baby, that's where we're going. Um, that's basically it. I just screamed at everybody. Where did Courtney Bell want you to go? She wanted me to pull over into um, the, um, I believe it's called Anderson Circle. 
What is Anderson Circle known for? Methamphetamine. I won't go in there. Is that a, uh, why would you not go in there? Because, my, I mean, when my son's father, both my children's father was on drugs, if he, if I knew he was on drugs, if he was in that neighborhood. So I personally would not go in that neighborhood. So um, did Courtney Bell want to go there before she wanted to go see where her baby was? Yes. Did you take her into Anderson Circle? No. Why not? Because it was an insane idea, and we were going to go to the baby. Did you take her? Where did you take her? To the baby, to the trailer park. And who did you meet with when y'all got there? Um, we saw the police and Tim's family, um, the Bell family, and um, just the news channel when everybody was there. Courtney Bell wanted to be taken to a place called Anderson Circle, an area known for access to methamphetamines. Lauren refused to take Bell into Anderson Circle because, quote, it was an insane idea, end quote. So she took her to the baby. After arriving back at the trailer park and talking to police, Lauren took Bell and her mother Pamela down to the police station for more questioning. While there, she tells detectives that she had gotten a call from her aunt who told her that Kalia had been found. When she repeated that out loud, McNabb started freaking out, saying, they're going to think I did this. She responded, how do you know she's not still alive? And then he jumped out of the car. When the detective inquires about whether or not she asked him if he did it, she says, quote, no, I was scared of his answer, end quote. Later that day, Christopher McNabb was arrested on his probation violation warrant. He was then interviewed by detectives again. Well, we might talk again today. It's just like we talked about yesterday. It's your, your daughter, Khalid. Okay? And you, I'm sure you're aware that she's been located, right? All right. Okay. Tell me about how you heard this. I was driving in the car on the way back up there. From, from all the way, you know what I mean? Okay. And I think it's her Aunt Kim called and she had her own speaker phone. It seems like they found her. And she said that she had passed away. She said that she was located on the side of the road and that she was dead. And that I just. They said all that on the phone. That was what that lady said. Her exact words was, Korea had done it, Korea had done it. She was found on the side of the road. My old lady was asking, well, why didn't she get found with the dog out right there? And then she just kept saying that I know it. She kept saying, Chris Dunn, Chris Dunn. So when I stopped at the red light, I jumped out, I wasn't done. Well, because people were, I mean, obviously, somebody told her that. She didn't just think it. Somebody told her that they thought I'd done it. Somebody told her, I mean, she had to have some kind of, some kind of, something other than her opinion, I thought. Yeah. So I felt like I was getting done for it anyway. The detective asks him to tell him how he heard about Kalia being located. McNabb claims that, while he was riding in the car, the one being driven by Lauren, Bell got a call from her aunt, who said that they found her and that she had passed away. The detective clarifies that the person on the phone said she passed away. This is because everyone else in the car made statements to the contrary. Then McNabb claims that he was told the body was located on the side of the road, and that she was dead and that he had done it. He says that Kim's exact words were, Chris done it, Chris done it. He says that Bell had questioned why the dogs hadn't found her if she was on the street, but Kim just kept saying that he had done it. This story doesn't match what was said by the other three adults who were in the car at the time. While being interviewed, the investigator notices that McNabb has an injury on his hand. It turns out that McNabb had punched a wall the previous night out of frustration, a sign that he tends to turn violent when he gets upset. The autopsy was completed on October 10th, and the cause of death was ruled a homicide. When this autopsy was conducted, did you uh, see um, baby Kalia removed from the body bag? I did. Did you observe um, how she was unwrapped, so to speak? I did. 
And can you tell the members of the jury uh, what you saw the child was wrapped in? Sure. As she was removed from the, the book bag or the backpack, uh, she was wrapped up in a baby light blue baby's blanket. Um, as That was unraveled. Um, she also had what we commonly refer to as a wife beater t-shirt, which is the, you know, the A-frame muscle t-shirt that men wear sometimes. Yes, you're right to the use of the term wife beater. It, it, we've all heard it's a sleeveless t-shirt. Go ahead. Um, that t-shirt was wrapped, one of the armholes was wrapped around her neck and covering her head. Um, she also had on a purple onesie that said, be careful boys, my daddy works out. Kalia's body was in a blue drawstring bag, wrapped in a baby blanket and a white sleeveless shirt. And based upon what you saw with your own eyes in terms of the injuries to the child and what Dr. Derisaw told you, um, did you have an opinion at this point in the investigation on the morning of the 9th when you attended the autopsy as to whether or not this child was uh, accidentally killed? Um, according to what we saw, in my experience, Dr. Darasaw's experience, and her telling me it was definitely not an accidental death at that point. Did Dr. Darasaw offer an opinion to you at that time um, as to whether or not there would be some bloody crime scene in connection with these um, injuries to the child? Right. As, as she even said on the stand here, that was a, that the wounds were all closed. There was some blood and that's to be expected with injuries like that but it was the, the wound to Kalia's head um, from the blunt force trauma that was experienced the skull the, the head still remained closed so there was no open wounds other than the, the, the cut under her eye and, and the cuts in her mouth. The blunt force trauma to the head was not an open wound so it would not have left a bloody crime scene. This would explain why there was no sign of blood inside the trailer home when it was searched. At that point, Christopher McNabb was charged with felony murder, aggravated battery, and concealing a death. He was held in jail with no bond. On October 20th, a call between McNabb and Bell was recorded by the jail. I didn't do it, Courtney. I swear to God, I didn't do it. I don't want you to do it, Chris. But I know I'm in fucking place. I woke up and I had to fucking go yeah, I was asleep with you. You don't seem to remember that, do you? Well, no, I let some get there. No, I let everybody else there. No, I let everybody else there. What in the hell are you talking about what everybody else said? Who was saying nobody else? Who? Jane. Your best friend Jane. So you got there. No, I did not text him at 7.30 or 8.30. I, don't, I, I did not text him at 7.30 or 8.30. I texted him after Bristol woke up. So I was standing in the middle of the living room texting on my phone. Do you not remember that? I was freaking out. The messages of court and Bill and Laura, they had like screenshotted and sent around to everybody too. So you were that. Screenshotted what? I was not. I was up. Like, for a minute. I can't, I can't understand what you're saying. A conversation about meeting her? I said something about if I met her, if I ever met her face to face, then we would talk about who all that I knew that she knew. That was the only thing that I said to her. I didn't say that was about actually, huh? At nine. What? At nine! No, it was not at nine. There are multiple theories about what actually happened to Kalia the morning of October 7, 2017. Some people believe that Christopher McNabb killed the baby and hid her body under a log in the woods. Other people believe that Courtney Bell killed the baby and hid her body in the woods, intentionally placing items belonging to McNabb with her to frame him for the murder. Then there are other people who believe that either one of them killed the baby and they both know about it. After listening to the phone recording, Bell either legitimately thinks that McNabb killed their baby or she's putting on a pretty good act to frame him. Some people suggested that he knew that she killed Kalia and was covering for her but I don't think they would have this type of argument if that was the case. In the recording, Bell questions him about texts and Facebook messages that were allegedly sent by him at times that he claimed to be asleep. 
One of McNabb's best friends, Shane Kidd, told police that he had received a text message from him at 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning. There was also a screenshot of messages he sent to a girl on Facebook. On December 13th, a few months after this phone call, the one where McNabb learned that his friend Shane Kidd had been helping the police, he met with the detectives to inform them that he knew who killed his daughter. You'll never guess who it is. He tells the detective that Courtney met a girl who asked her to take a ride with her so she could talk to her about who had killed her baby. And she went and she got a new Harvey girl. And she asked her, who killed my baby? I want to know who killed my child. And the girl said that Shane Kid killed her baby. Shane Kid? Shane Kid. Jeremy Shane Kid. I, this person, this dude was like with me almost every day. He was with us almost every day. When Khalil was first born in the hospital, when we got her and brought her to the car, take her home, he was in the car. He was with us that day. He was there. He was always there. Pretty much like, not, you know, not every minute of every day, but more than not, he was there. You know what I mean? Like, I called him home and he called me nephew. You know what I mean? Like, he, we didn't know each other for a long time. Him and my dad got some trouble together back in like 98. Because, I mean, I was eight years old, nine years old, you know. And they got us in trouble together or whatever. And, um, so, I mean, he's been, a, he's been a family acquaintance for a long time off and on. So, she says that the girl told her that Shane Kidd told this girl named Sierra that somebody important put a hit out on me. I don't know why. I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that any of this is true. I don't know. But this is something that Courtney Hurt, she had um, said it, or y'all would really be looking into it. I'm pretty sure. I hope, I hope y'all would be. You know what I mean? What a coincidence. Shane Kidd is the person who killed Kalia? Not only that, but someone important had put a hit out on McNabb. But for some reason, instead of him getting killed, Shane snuck into his house, walked past him sleeping on the couch without killing him, took the baby out of her sleeper, took a bag, a shirt, and a few other items that belonged to McNabb, and snuck back out without waking anyone up. Then Shane killed the baby, put her and the random items in the bag, and hid her body under a log in the woods near the trailer park. Perfectly plausible. Not buying it? Nobody else did either. On January 1st, 2018, Courtney Bell was arrested and charged with second-degree murder, second-degree cruelty to children, and contributing to the depravity of a minor. The prosecutor argued that, even though they didn't believe that she caused the injuries that killed Kalia, she was partially responsible for the death of her child due to neglect that stemmed from drug use. The couple were tried together in May of 2019, and the prosecution brought a heavy list of people to testify against them. Courtney Bell's father, her mother, her cousin, their neighbor, Lauren McKee, Shane Kidd, and even the girl he was communicating with on Facebook the morning of Kalia's murder. Christopher McNabb was found guilty on all charges. At sentencing, prosecutors present evidence of aggravating circumstances for the judge to take into account when they're deciding how they're going to sentence. McNabb had an issue with what one of the witnesses had to say about him. And at some point in time, did Mr. McNabb tell you to look up? He did. And when you looked, um, where was he at in, in relation to you? He was probably an inch or two away from the glass, okay. right in front of my face. So were you separated by glass? We were separated by glass. And what um, did you see when he asked you to look? He had, he was wearing a turtle suit, um, which is something that prisoners are wearing when they're on suicide risk. And that he wasn't wearing clothing under that. And he had pulled up the turtle suit and taken out his penis and was masturbating. And did he masturbate um, to completion in your presence? He did. Thank you. Those are all the questions that I have. Pardon? No questions. I got a question. Can I, can I address the court, please? Okay. I just, I just got one thing I want to say, and that's it. I'd like to say it in front of her since she's the one accusing me. I'm going to allow you to talk when your time comes. McNabb finally got his chance to address the court. 
I just like I just like uh, the court to know, as well as everybody at home, since this is being broadcasted for whatever reasons, that I did have on a, a turtle suit and it velcros and it wasn't on properly and it didn't fit properly and the velcros were not on good because they don't stick because they get, they've been used for so many years by so many different people and I was not masturbating at all in front of her. Period. The thing fell off when I stood up and that was it. There was no. None of that, and I would have liked to have told her that since she was the one making the accusation. Since I'm pretty sure by my, my the law states that I have a right to confront my witnesses who accuse me of doing wrong. So I felt like I wanted to say it in front of her since she was the one up here slandering yeah. me. And that's all I got now, to say. You sure you don't want to talk about the sentencing and all of that? That was the only thing you wanted to tell the court? I mean, that's I haven't heard anything about a sentence. I was just well, commenting on that. I understand the charges. that. I just wanted to know if you had anything you wanted to say to the court. I mean, I got a lot to say. I got, I, I got a lot to say, but I'm not going to be able to say half of it. I don't know because I don't know what you're going to say. I'm innocent. I didn't do it. Okay. I've, I've maintained that the whole time. I feel like there was things that were allowed to be said that should have never been allowed to have been said. It didn't have no, nothing whatsoever to do with the case and what was being said. Just because somebody has domestic abuse issues with their spouse doesn't mean that they would put their hands on their kids, which has also been pretty much proved that I've never touched my kids in any harmful manner whatsoever. I've never harmed my kids. I didn't even hear anything that said that I had done anything to her in front of the kids. So that doesn't make sense either. And, you know, just to let the record show that I, I, I don't think I ever, ever put my hands on her in front of those kids. And I just don't, I just don't feel like just because somebody has domestic issues with the female in their life that they love, that they were just able to just say, oh, he don't love you and all that stuff just in front of everybody or whatever, which doesn't matter. But I just don't understand how you find somebody guilty of doing something to a 15-day-old baby because there was no evidence whatsoever that proved anything about me putting my hands on my kids. I've never done it. I never would. I don't believe in it. I was beat as a child, and I don't agree with it at all, and I would never do it. I would never do this. That's all I got to say. I would never do it. I'm innocent. Well, I can make a lot of comments on what you said. I can make a lot of comments on the trial, but I know that was just be arguing with you or talking with you. I'll ask you one simple question. You claim you're innocent, so you tell me what sentence the man or woman that you claim did this should receive. If you ever find out who did them, they deserve to be under the jail. Okay. So they ought to get the maximum sentence. Most definitely. Okay. On the crime of malice murder, I sentence you to life in confinement without parole. On considering the death of another, I sentence you to 10 years in confinement consecutive or after. Count one. Do you understand each of your sentences? Yes, sir. McNabb was adamant about making sure the court and the world knew that he was not masturbating like the witness claimed. When the judge asked him if he had anything to say about sentencing, he didn't seem to quite understand that he was being sentenced. But once he found out, he took the opportunity to proclaim his innocence one more time. He then proceeded to encourage the judge to give him the maximum sentence, which he did. He was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, plus 10 years to be served consecutively. He will never be released from prison. Courtney Bell was found guilty on all charges and sentenced to 30 years, with 15 served in prison and 15 served as probation. She also received 10-year and 5-year sentences to be served concurrently. If you like this show, please subscribe or leave me a rating on whatever podcast app you use. On YouTube, you can subscribe, hit like, or leave me a comment. If you'd like to support the show, you can donate a few dollars through Buy Me A Coffee. You can click the link on our website or YouTube channel, or go to buymeacoffee.com backslash monsters. If you shop on Amazon, you can go to our website and click on the Amazon banner, where you can purchase items at no additional charge, but will get a small commission. I'm always trying to increase my content and improve its quality, and your support will help me do that. Thank you in advance.